Well, I feel so humble between these uh, two gentlemen here. Um, I'm from Holland, and uh, if you would speak Dutch, you would say I, I'm called Marije Vogelsang, which um, translated into English would sound Mariah Birdsong. So it sounds pretty musical. But you know, I'm a really bad singer, and so I had to choose another career, and I de decided to become a designer. So I went to design school in Eindhoven in Holland, and uh, what you study there is product design. So um, as all students there, I started to do um, experiments and research with materials. So I went to the wood sh workshop, I went to the ceramics workshop, I, I did some plastic molding and all these kind of things. But in the end, I always find myself back in the kitchen. And being in the kitchen, I opened my cupboards and I thought, wow, I've got lots of material here. And I saw my kitchen tools and I thought, hey, these are my workshop tools. And then I started to see food as a material you can work with. But then you get this thing that people think, ah, oh, yeah, that's a food designer. And um, then I was wondering if I would be a food designer, I would actually, it would imply that I design food. And I think actually food is perfectly designed by nature. Just imagine a red cabbage sliced in two. It's fantastic. So what I'm more interesting interested in is to look at the verb of eating and um, to what food does to your body, what food does to your mind, what food does to people in general, and what food does to the world. And I'd like to apply um, design ideas, but uh, I think it's more in general creative thinking onto that. And um, I have a short amount of time, so I try to uh, show you in a short, um, flick through of a portfolio, what I do. I have this company called Proof. Proof means tasting, it also means testing. I started in Rotterdam with a restaurant that was also my design studio. I thought it was a perfect idea. I thought, well, I have a design studio and I invite everybody to come and then I have guinea pigs that they can, I can try out my new ideas on. And um, it was fun and uh, we did it for five years and I got completely mad sitting inside a restaurant doing my designs. So uh, I left that place and um, I started in Amsterdam and that's my design studio. I have some chickens, I have a, uh, just three. Uh, I mean, it's nothing compared um, to the <laughs> professionals. I have a little uh, green garden where we um, use uh, our own produce. And um, I do actually lots of kind of um, projects. Uh, actually, I base my work on which I'll just, um, if it's an interesting project and then I will do it. Um, so, uh, this is not chronological, but I will start with the first project I, I did. I was still a, a student at the Design Academy, and my teacher told me to do something with the color of white. And in many cultures, the color of white is the color of death. And I was thinking about uh, my own country and our funeral rituals. Well, if you're Dutch and you die, then uh, that's not really the best place to die. Because people go to your funeral, they dress in black, uh, they have their sad face on um, and they say, I'm really sorry. And then they drink a cup of coffee and they get a slice of sponge cake and that's it. So <laughs> I thought it's, it's just the poorest thing. And in many cultures, uh, there are really rich uh, rituals around um, funerals and food. And I think it makes sense because food is comforting to you. Food is the first thing that your mother gives to you together with her love. So I think it's such a strong thing. So I wanted to make a kind of uh, alternative, uh, alternative for these poor Dutch people that don't have any rituals. Um, so what I did is I just collected lots of white food. I didn't know anything about the taste or the flavor. I just collected white food. And uh, I put it together and I prepared them very simply, very respectful to the food itself. And I actually noticed that besides getting a very serene picture, you also get a very serene palette because actually white foods combine really well together. And so the flavors, they go really well together. This is the same thing. I also did the whole ceramics and the uh, clothing with it. So it was a whole design ceremony and ritual. And actually uh, I did this and um, I presented it many times, but I never really did it for a real funeral because you never know when someone dies and my company is not really uh, made for these fast actions. I can't really make a, uh, a funeral dinner in three days. So uh, I, I have this book and I, I'm asking in my book uh, that if you know when you're going to die, <laughs> so some people know that, and you want this, then please call me, because I really want to do this. Um, 
Ah, I'm really serious about it. So um, this is not chronological, so this is years later, and um, I've been doing lots of uh, food-related uh, events and projects. And um, every time people have asked me to do uh, a Christmas dinner, and I, ne I never wanted to do it. I thought, oh my God, Christmas is so full of rituals, like uh, cliches, uh, uh, Christmas decorations, and all the mm, lots of food. And I just thought, what can I design about it? But then um, I was asked to do it again by a very nice company called Droog Design, Droog, we call it here. And um, I thought, what is Christmas really about? And if you look besides the Christian idea of Christmas, for me, I think Christmas is only about sharing food together and being connected to each other. And so what I did here is a very simple installation. It's just a tablecloth that instead of letting it hang down, I put it up into the air and made some slits in it. And this is what happens. Um, <laughs> it's very strange to be inside there, and um, I do have reasons to do it. And one of the reasons is that if you are in a, in a tablecloth with only your head and your hands, and you're all sitting in this position, you're physically connected to each other, because if I pull here, you can feel it there. But also there's this kind of communist idea that if you're all, um, uh, if you all can only see your face and not your clothes, uh, you're, you're becoming equal, it's like wearing a uniform. And having people sitting in this situation, th this is 40 people that didn't know each other. Uh, they came together like this, and because they were all in this situation, they really, eventually at the end of the table, they, uh, at the end of the night, they felt very connected to each other. Um, the nicest thing is when you go to the toilet. <laughs> I actually prefer this one. Um, I also did it in Tokyo with Japanese people, and I was really scared to do it because I really thought they might not do it because uh, it was a very official place and people really uh, acted according to protocol. Um, so I did invite them to sit in the table. Um, I will talk about that later. Uh, it's, it's not only the setting, it's really also about the food. And this is also an example that I'm, I'm really not a food designer because you see this girl is just eating some melon. What she has is a normal plate and this plate is cut in two. So there are two halves. And she has melon. The person sitting opposite of her has ham. Ham and melon is a classical combination. All of us know that. So people will start to share. You don't have to tell them what to do. They will just do it naturally. Um, this is in, in Tokyo again. And, and the nice thing here was that people, uh, well, they were kind of stiff, I have to say. But when they started, <laughs> is that a strange thing to say? <laughs> when they started to sit into this tablecloth, they transformed into children and they started to play and to interact together. And that was a really interesting finding for me. And um, the main course existed out of um, a plate with just one thing on it. So one person would get a whole pea, big piece of rib. The next person would get a whole lettuce, still together but clean and with croutons and dressings on top. The third person would get a whole pumpkin stuffed with seeds and nuts. And the fourth person would only get the potatoes. So people start to share. You don't have to tell them what to do. They will. The nice thing in Japan was, though, that people are not used to having big pieces of meat. They only have small pieces at the table, so they can use the chopsticks. And uh, I, didn't, um, I didn't direct this, but for some reason, only the man got the meat. And they were so happy, and they turned red and started to thank me in person for the meat. And that was a really cool thing to understand. <laughs> so I don't want to lock people up in my designs. I think it's very important. It's an idea that you can enter to and you're a part of. People sometimes ask me, when is your design ready? Is it when it's on, the food is on the table and it looks nice? And I think, no, that's, that's stupid. The food, the design is ready when it's inside your body. Maybe when you take it home, maybe when you go to the toilet. It becomes a part of you. And that's the interesting thing about being a designer, working with food. I mean, I've never seen people eating a table before, or a chair, or an iPhone. Um, this is something I call a food wave. It's a three meter long table. And uh, there are 30 different kind of snacks on top of that. And every snack is made out of three ingredients. And every other snack changes one ingredient, and the next changes one, changes one. So it's kind of an ongoing circle, and the last one is connected to the first one, so you can just keep on eating if you want. <laughs> um, it was a really hard puzzle, though. Um, 
Well, this is a project, um, it's a bit difficult to explain maybe, but um, it's very dear to me. I was invited um, by the founder of the first um, organic farmers market in uh, Beirut in Lebanon. And his vision is by recreating food every day, is recreating their culture. And because Lebanon has been pretty much destroyed by war, that's a very valuable thing to do. So he has this market and he, he wants to create something there. So he asked me to join the market and do a workshop there. So I thought, wow, I would love to do that, but I don't know anything about this country. And actually, as a Dutch person, only, the only thing I've always heard about Lebanon is only war. And so I went there and first I wanted to talk to these people because I thought, well, maybe they're really not interested in what I have to, what I have to share with them. So maybe first I want to know more about them. So I handed them this, this, this questionnaire. And the, the most two important questions for me here were firstly, what are your positive memories about your childhood and food? Secondly, what are your memories when it came to war and food? And that, that was the essence of what I wanted to know. Well, um, the first question was very varied. People have very different um, re memories when, of food when they were little. Uh, but the second uh, question was answered uh, mainly by the answer that bread was something that reminded people of war. And bread still is a very important element in Lebanese cuisine. So uh, what I wanted to do is a workshop where I got very many different people together because people in this country don't feel connected to each other. They feel that they're very separated either by region, either by religion, either by politics or uh, by their social, social um, background. And um, so I got a very varied group of people together and I wanted to make bowls with them, bowls that were made out of bread. And we colored these bowls green with parsley juice because parsley, parsley is one of the main ingredients of Lebanese cuisine. And um, I asked these people to write their positive food memories of when they were little into these bowls. So it was all a very positive thing. Eventually, we, we went to the farmer's market and we presented all these bowls as the green line. And I don't know if all of you know that the green line is like a line of demarcation that separated East and West Beirut from each other, just like the, the Berlin Wall did for many years. So it has a very negative connotation about it. So we made this green line of bowls with positive, um, with positive memories inside. And we invited everybody in the market to come and eat these bowls with us. We filled them up with Lebanese cheese and yogurt and honey and all really nice things. And also the bowls, you could eat them because it was bread. And by actually eating the bowls, we were eating away this negative um, connotation of the green line. And also we were physically sharing each other's positive food memories of when we were little. What I really like about this project is that you can see that all these bowls are very different, they're very unique, just like all these people that participated in this workshop, just like actually all of us are. And when we started the first day of the workshop, we just had one big dough. And all these bowls we made from this one dough. And that's a bit how we had, um, how, how I see these people, it's just like, and how I see everybody, it's like we are made from the same material, we just came out of the oven in a different way. And that's for me a very important lesson. Um, these are cupcakes with a lack of attention. They really say, take me, take me. But actually, they don't really taste so good. And it's very interesting to see because people really react to these kind of messages. People are very, um, they're very biased. Actually, people are very irrational. And I think that's very interesting to try and find out with food. Um, this is Uni. Uni is a very cute girl. Uh, here she was two and a half years old. And yeah, she's lovely, um, but she doesn't eat, eat her vegetables. And I was a bit af ashamed of my daughter not eating vegetables. And I thought, oh my. So I read this thing that um, children have to eat something uh, seven times before uh, they will appreciate the flavor. So uh, what I did is I invited her with all the friends from the daycare. And I told them we're going to make bling bling because I couldn't say jewelry because there were boys involved too. And um, the only tools they got was their teeth. So they started to shape all these bling bling and they started to taste it and she eats her vegetables. So. 
Um, thank you. Um, well, this is another project uh, also for children. Uh, I've done this, this uh, eight years ago in the Bronx in New York. There's a pediatrics clinic. They have a big problem with obese children. Um, they asked me to do a healthy snack corner and I thought, yeah, I don't know if, if I'm going to make a salad bar. I don't think that will really work there. And so I looked at where these children are and these, most of their parents don't cook for them. They eat only, well, mostly fast food, deep fried things. And um, I thought, it's a shame, because these th th children, they know it's not good for them to eat unhealthy food. It's, they know that's the wrong thing, but they don't know how to get out of that system. They don't know how to appreciate healthy food. Mm -hmm. So they always have a negative feeling about food, and I thought, it's such a shame, because food can be so much more than only calories. Food can give you energy. Food can, can uh, make you feel happy or make, can even make you feel sleepy if you want to. You, it just has so many more things. So um, what I did is I made a series of snacks uh, in all the colors of the rainbow. And I took the color philosophy by Leonardo da Vinci. And uh, this philosophy says that red gives you energy and blue makes you relaxed. That's a kind of common knowledge that most people accept. But it has lots of other things to say. It also says green makes you rich, yellow makes you to have a lot of friends, orange makes you happy. And I, what I did is I color-coded all these snacks. So I, on every snack, I labeled what uh, this color could do to your body. And um, I didn't talk about whether these snacks were healthy or unhealthy. <coughs> of course they were healthy, but that's a very boring subject. So I just told them, well, you can pick what you want. So these children, they will pick their food according to another reason. So it's not about good food, bad food, negative feeling, good feeling healthy, unhealthy, fat, slim, whatever, but it's changing their perception about uh, the, the feeling that the food gives them. Um, so now they could say, well, I'm going to eat green food because I want to be rich. And I want to be, eat yellow food because I want to have a lot of friends. So um, this is the same project, just presented in a different way. And on top you can see what all the f uh, colors could do for you. And we wanted to also make this into a cookbook and everything, but eventually the whole project uh, didn't happen because they didn't have any money. But I'm now working with a, with a Dutch uh, hospital on malnourishment, actually. And uh, I think still it's a very interesting thing to, uh, to try to change what's in your mind about food. In, um, um, instead of, of telling people you should act differently, because for many people that's very hard to realize. So this is all the same project, just presented in a different way. Um, uh, this is a, a candy box for people that have no teeth because I thought it was such a shame if you have fake teeth. I think you don't really enjoy eating candy, so I thought, oh, let's make a box that you can take your teeth out and then eat lots of things that are easy to eat without. Um, that's really helping the world. I want to be quick because I really want to show you, you this one. Um, for me, that's an that's a important one. This is the Dutch National Tap Water Tasting. Um, if you go to Holland, you might find uh, that uh, this is a country with, um, one, it's, it, it's one of the most purest tap waters in the world. And if you go from city to city, you actually taste that the tap water tastes very differently if you drink it from the tap. But Dutch people, they use one, 130 liters of tap water a day and they don't care really about it and they just think it's very normal. So I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to get um, tap water from all the 12 capitals in uh, this country Together, instead of you traveling to all, these comp uh, uh, to all these cities, it goes to one place. And you can actually taste, it's a kind of tasting. Um, but I also want to, to show, you can see there's 130 bottles in the top that shows how many you spend in a day. And this is an empty water basin. I don't know if you can, can you go a slide back, please? So this is an empty water basin, and there are 12 really large shelves uh, shelving systems, just like the, the cl a clock, and you can just go from shelf to shelf and taste all the waters. And I wanted to do this because I thought, when it comes to wine, we always say, oh, it's about the terroir of the wine, and it's really important about where this wine comes from and then well, you, what, you, what you can eat it with. And then I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice if I would say, well, tonight I'm going to eat chicken, so I need uh, to have some Amsterdam tap water, and then <laughs> if I eat beef, I might have some Utrecht, tap water. Um, so 
It would be, and actually it really tastes very different. Also the water here tastes very different. I really like to have that kind of taste memory. I'm running out of time. Um, I'm just going through the slides very quickly. This is garden cress. You can just uh, have it grow on any fluffy material. People sometimes grow it on cotton and uh, cotton wool. And um, we sometimes grow it on aprons and then we pick it off and put it as garnish on a cocktail. Um, <laughs> this project I can't explain to you because it's so complicated, but um, I can talk to you after this if you want and I can explain it to you. Uh, sugar spoons, you can stir them in your tea and then they will dissolve. Um, this is a lollipop. It's actually, uh, it shows what sugar can do to your body. Um, and uh, I don't know if I, if I can, can I? Okay, you, you told me so. <laughs> okay, well, this is one I really want to tell you because it's an it's a important project for me. Um, there was um, an opening uh, for an exhibition about the Second World War in a uh, museum in Rotterdam. And they had a lot of people there that actually survived the war. And Rotterdam has been bombed very severely during that time. And there was a big food shortage. Lots of people starved from that. And um, they asked me to make the snacks for the opening of this, of this event. And what I did is I got original war recipes from the Resistance Museum. And I just made the recipes. I didn't design anything of it. I just made them very small, just like little hors d'oeuvres. And uh, I put them on a cardboard sheet, like a ranchion. And when people came in, they got a coupon. And with the coupon, they could get some surrogate coffee. And with the surrogate coffee, they got their ranchion. And some people that were there, they didn't have the tastes of this food in their mouth for over 60 years. So what happened is that some people really got back memories of that time. And that was a very painful but beautiful thing because it was something that was part of their life and they have forgotten about it. And now they got it back. And I think it's incredible if you're a designer and you make things, then you make things that are a waste eventually. But when you use food as a material for your design, first of all, you can come very close to someone because someone will put your design in your body. But also, by making something that you can consume, you're actually not working on the consumer uh, society. So I think that's an interesting thing. And this is, for me, a very big reason to work with food. And this is where I keep it. Thank you.